All right, welcome to everyone's favorite segment, Mailbag. Let's get to it. I've got a ton of stuff. I think there's about 30 odd packages. Just <laughs> can't get through them. I don't want to say stop sending them, but yeah, maybe for a little while. <laughs> anyway, this one comes from I, I, Wit, W Feeler, Wit Feeler. I'm not quite sure. And I think it's from Maine in the United States of America. All my viewers from Maine. I've never been to Maine. Um, let's. Well, bubble wrapped. Let's have a look. It's a little matrix auto chromatic tuner. Two minute tear down. So, this is the Matrix SR4000 auto chromatic tuner. I have no idea what one is. I'm not a musician, but yeah, you either in tune or you aren't and you can calibrate the thing there's the microphone which uh, can determine like if you're in an orchestra or something if you're in or out of tune I guess something like that I'm sure the more musically inclined will uh, leave it in the comments and here we are inside the puppy old school looks like single-sided layout I doubt there's going to be anything on the top so let's oh there's our battery snap what oh yeah yeah oh, double-sided construction Fancy pantsy. Woohoo! What do we have? Look at this. Intel 80C51 Classic. We got a uh, date code on that. 8901, 1989. Jeez, I thought it would be a bit earlier than that. And um, yeah, there's not much at all. It's all just uh, processor uh, controlled. It wouldn't have a analog to digital uh, converter. So it's likely just doing um, that. It'd probably be a microphone uh, preamp. So GL358, is that an LM? A, you know, a knockoff LM358 uh, perhaps? If so, that's probably being used as the mic uh, preamp there, and they're probably just like squaring that up and feeding it into the micro, and then the micro is just doing uh, timing. That's basically all it's going to be doing. It's not going to be doing any sort of signal processor or anything like that. Um, classic, those, um, I'm not sure... I, I can't remember what style of LEDs they're actually, what they actually call them, but yeah, your classic um, <laughs> uh, bent leaded resistor, formed leaded resistors here with a little kink in them, absolutely, totally old school from the uh, 70s and 80s, but yeah, these are uh, tapered bar graph um, LEDs, they made them larger at the bottom and then taped them up, fairly common, and uh, Got a uh, oddball square one and the triangle ones in there as well. And that puppy is screaming along at 10 megahertz. Woohoo! And uh, not exactly sure how it works, but obviously you select your um, your key or whatever it is on here and then you can uh, determine whether or not you're in tune. So let's see if I'm in tune, shall we? Still have no idea what I'm doing, but here we go. And check out the array of transistors that they got here, all driving the LEDs there. <laughs> Hilarious. Didn't have enough grunt on the uh, 8051. So that's quite a crude little uh, thing. I mean, it looks like they just got a transistor voltage regulator up here because it's just a 9 volt battery snap. And uh, yeah, it's probably what those transistors up there are doing. Uh, making a crude uh, 5 volt regulator. As I said, it's probably just like squaring up the microphone signal, doing some timing stuff, and it, you know, it's got a few modes and calibration things and stuff like that. So yeah, you know, there's probably actually quite a bit of uh, smarts inside that puppy, but yeah, totally old school construction. Thanks, Tom. Next up, one from Romania. Just came in this morning, actually. Well, it was on top of the pile there. Yeah, sorry, I should probably open ones that have been sitting here for months, shouldn't I? That's very bad. I won't say who it's from, because it kind of might give away. If you know the name, it might give away what's actually in here. So, hi to all my Romanian viewers. We have, ta-da, the Parrot Clip, which is... um. I, I've never actually used one. I've heard a lot about them. They're like a, a new, well, not new, I think they're, I don't know, probably maybe a decade old now. I've been hearing about them forever. And um, they're parrot clips. They're um, designed to be like a modern, um, 
dual sort of clip that's better hooky type thing hence parrot you know parrots have hooked beaks or something don't they um and whoa look at a whole box full of them let's check them out so thank you very much Filipesco for sending in all these parrot clips take a look at the collection here and well let's take a look at what parrot clips are there's three different uh, types PCX PCM and PCS and they're basically look it looks like a parrot it's got a little hook on it and yeah it's just another way to hook on to um, in, in this case like they can come in different uh, sizes down to one 1.5 millimeters there for uh, to small terminals and things like that but I think they do show like I see um, pins and stuff like that so we'll try that out so I think we've got various uh, sizes here so let's take a closer look at them they're just an alternative to your easy hook that you're used to or a cr uh, crocodile or alligator clip check it out made in Romania I know all my Romanian viewers awesome how much stuff is made in Romania these days anyway look you can get them in all different types of uh, configurations this is the uh, smallest one so we've got the tiny one millimeter uh, tip here they can come in different uh, rated voltages different cat ratings and uh, current ratings as well and temperature ratings and also um well what's in connection to the lead solder i guess it's either solder or crimped is that a, like a thermal emf uh, thing I'm not uh, not entirely sure but look they come in all different uh, uh, configurations this one's got like extendable banana jack so you can actually um, uh, plug that in and they tap off you can plug another banana plug in the end then we've got standard right angle uh, four millimeter shrouded ones for your banana plug we've got ones with just the um, open uh, clip like that so you can clip those around uh, test posts and things like that and uh, yeah more multimeter type probes it looks like these are just uh, uh, free floating uh, like to adjust the connectors uh, themselves so that you can hook on your own wire so here's the clip itself and they do feel rather plasticky and a bit cheapish I must say I'm not uh, hugely impressed by the quality they're certainly adequate and look if I put a bit of force on that I can get that to actually um, like not close properly like that depending on how I uh, how I actually get my what angle I get that on so in terms of quality I'm not hugely impressed by them but I do like the concept how that uh, closes you can close that around wires I think that uh, is going to work really well and I can't see it uh, you know breaking loose or anything like that it's um it's rather a good concept it's all patented and all that sort of uh, jazz but yeah like just folded metal in there for the uh, test clip they they almost not homemade but they're they're not manufactured to a massively high standard but I do like the concept and this individual clip here actually has a banana socket in there and you can just plug your banana plug in that fits quite well so yeah I thought you could uh, fit a bare wire into there but no not really it doesn't uh, do that it's designed for a four millimeter banana plug and here's the difference between the biggest one the W4 one here and the W1 little one millimeter thing it's tiny the one millimeter one's actually square on the end it's not re almost square it's not really uh, sort of hooked like that one but uh, it's still going to work a treat I think so if I get this breadboard wire here and just whack that in there like that that's having a hard time getting out of that even without a decent hook on there so yeah I think these even these tiny ones work really well I don't mind that at all but if you compare the parrot clip to one of these tiny little easy hooks here which sort of get in there and can grab the wire like that I think yeah the oh no they're probably on par in terms of strength I suspect but that totally depends on the type of easy hook here we go I've got another one this is just a cheap one that comes with uh, logic probes typically comes with logic probes and I I think these ones are the easy hooks are ultimately got a much smaller area so if you're going to grab IC pins and things like that there's just less metal to short out there we go I think they're just physically smaller these easy hooks so 
If I was doing IC pins, I think I'd rather have the easy hook. But the problem with uh, easy hooks is that they don't come with like nice attachments that you can then, uh, you know, go and plug into your multi meter. Whereas this comes with all sorts of, you know, we've got the piggyback style banana plugs, we've got the shrouded ones here, and uh, we've got these um, uh, binding post uh, clips. And, you know, I, yeah, I mean, these are just bigger, sort of like uh, more robust and. If you have a look at these ones, check out the uh, finger guards on these. So if you're probing, like, you know, decent voltage stuff, then, you know, you don't want to be dicking around with, like, an alligator clip or, or something like that. These are much safer. And they come with really nice silicone leads as well. Ah, oh, these are just beautifully flexible, just like proper multimeter leads. Awesome. And there we go. Jiang Ying Xing, for those playing along at home, uh, 600 volt. So these that look to be, um, oh, there you go. They got, uh, yeah, they're suitably rated. No problems at all. Underwriters Laboratory. So yeah, that's 10 amp Cat 3, 600 volts. So yeah, I really like these. And I think these paraclips are a good solution for, you know, just get your fingers in there like that and just bam. And it's got a decent hook on the end of it. I think they're really, uh, like actually that one, it's different to what we saw before. Look, that one's got more of a hook on it than this one. Like the smaller one there, it's uh, it's not quite as hooked as much. Anyway, they do grip fairly well. Quite innovative, and I'd rather use these than uh, alligator clips any day of the week. Very nice. Well, I'll tell you what, I really wouldn't want to use these to probe IC pins that just it just doesn't work. Completely wrong tool for the job. Look, it can easily short out to the one next to it. Whereas with your easy hook, look at that, no problems whatsoever. So yeah, I think it's a bit rich to show that, like, you know, <laughs> through hole ICs on here. Granted, it does not show you it actually hooking into an IC uh, pin on here. This is what they're for, for hooking onto wires and other, you know, maybe through hole resistors and, you know, other large components, things like that. But I do rather like these. These will be a nice addition to the lab here and probably everyone should have a set, I suspect. Just, you know, just really quite nice uh, uh, hook probes, you know, better than the big ass alligator clips anyway for high voltage stuff and, you know, any sort of reasonable size, that's for sure. And there is a lot of spring tension force on here. I can't obviously, uh, this is not feelo vision, but there is a lot of force actually holding these back. So I expect to get really good contact on uh, wires and be fairly low resistance and fairly reliable contact. And of course, you've got metal on metal contact as well. And I think ultimately what they are trying to uh, show here with this PCB is that this metal, this pointed metal tip on here can actually be used as a probe to get in there and probe pins. Well, yeah, okay, but then so can your usual multimeter probe. So thank you very much, Filipescu, for sending in all these parrot clips. These will uh, come in handy, no doubt, but yep, for big stuff, not for tiny little PCB stuff. Next up, one from Australia. How can I tell? Well, it's an Australia Post padded bag and it's got an Australia Post stamp on it. It's from uh, Timothy B. Thank you very much, Timothy. He's from uh, Roseville here in Sydney, not that far away. Although Sydney's a reasonably big place, you know, what are there, four million people in Sydney or something? And it's about, you know, it's, it's a half radius. Sydney's like a half uh, radius from the coast uh, going all extends all the way to the base of the uh, Blue Mountains pretty much so um, Yeah, we've got lots of little bagged parts. We've got lots of individual capacitors Farnell capacitors in bags and a Genuine is it genuine or is it dodgy Apple? Oh, it's not just a charger. It's got an Ethernet uh, port thingo and a USB and like an audio microphone Thing. I'm giving you some capacitors I was going to use to replace the one hung low capacitors that were in the TV he was trying to repair, but he drilled too large of a hole and I was trying to remove the and therefore stuffed up the PCB. Oops, so thank you very much. Um, good to have um, assorted capacitors and stuff go in the um, go in the component trays over there. Awesome. Um, 
No more use for the caps? Uh, yes, I've included an old Apple Airport Express. Aha, uh -huh. see, I don't know my Apple products. Uh, you may want to show in a Teardown Tuesday episode. Maybe a two-minute Teardown here. Hmm. Now, because this requires a very messy Dremel to get apart, I suspect, um, then I think I will leave this for a Teardown Tuesday. Thank you very much, Timothy. And of course, we got one from Deutschland. Hi to all my German viewers again. Um, this one comes from Roland Christophic. He's from uh, Dusseldorf. Um, I've never been to Dusseldorf. As I said, the only places I've been in Germany are um, Hamburg and Lübeck. So they're the only cities I've been to, apart from a brief stopover in an airport somewhere. Um, that was about it. So let's see what we have a note. And, oh, this is a vintage electronic device. We love vintage stuff here. It's in several parts, or maybe it's several vintage electronic devices. Geez, that weighs a bit. And uh, is this a, um, could be a t-shirt. Could be a t-shirt. Let's have a look. I don't know what it says. What does it say? I can't read, I can't read the camera from here. <laughs> Do salts, Nick? Lugan, I can't pronounce that. I won't even try. Um, I hope it doesn't say something rude. Should I just immediately go wear it uh, down to the shops or something? Perhaps. Thank you very much. I don't know what it stands for, but um, I'm sure someone will inform me. Or it's on the note. And there's Roland and his son. He's a tall fella with their um awesome looking bikes. Are those uh, beamers? Fantastic. Anyway, um, he has sent in. Let's have a look here. Oh, there's a ton. Oh, look at this. Sony Video Walkman. Wow. Vintage. <laughs> this is absolutely hilarious. A Video 8 Walkman. Oh, that's great. This is definitely not a two minute teardown. This is, oh, look at that. Look at that. That would have been the duck's guts back in the day, right? What um, vintage are we talking about here? And he says the GV8, although this is the GV9 model, about 1989 um, vintage or thereabouts. Oh, fantastic. And this is um, interesting because I was actually going to do a video on this. I had planned it. It's just a matter of getting one. Let's have a look. Ta-da! Oh, the Sony DAT. Walkman, fantastic, the digital audio tape um, system. Is that still going, officially supported, or did it just, I think it just died in the ass. Um, oh, oh, no, it didn't, sorry, no, I lie. I think that, you know, the DAT format was very popular for a while, the digital audio tapes, and one of the original Sony Walkmans, the TPS L2. I don't know, I don't think that's like the original one. Because after I did that um, Sony memory card video, I got all nostalgic about uh, uh, old Sony products, and I was going to try and get hold of like the original 1979 Sony Walkman for a vintage uh, teardown. So I'm not quite sure of this date, early 80s probably. Yeah, about early 80s. Ah, I just checked, and yes, this is the very first original 1979 Sony Walkman, the TPS L2. It is. I thought I recognised like the blue and the grey, um, but I thought it might have might have been the uh, second model. Um, Roland says he uh, bought this in the spring of 1980. So whether or not it was, uh, well, they probably weren't sitting on the shelves for a year because these were the hot product back in the day, and fantastic, I was looking for one of these on eBay, awesome! Thank you very much Roland, that's fantastic, I will definitely do a Sony Vintage Teardown, could I include them all in the one video, maybe three separate video, oh jeez, I could have a, film them all in the same day and release them as three separate videos, but thank you very much, I definitely wanted to do this video, so I will endeavour to do that, oh I'm super excited, awesome, thanks Roland. And by the way, the t-shirt says, you shall not lie. And well, I never lie. I just spin a bit of a yarn. 
Well, Roland and Max have certainly sent in some classics here, and these will make for a fantastic separate teardown. As I said, I was really trying to get one of these uh, uh, puppies, and uh, at one stage I thought, yeah, it'd be interesting to do a dat teardown as well comparison, and we got both of them plus the video one we'll take a quick look at. Yes, the TPS L2, this is what started everything. 19... 79 and it's for those who weren't around in the 1980s it was dominated by the sony walkman this is what started the personal music revolution and it was like it was phenomenal it was just everyone had a sony walkman and then other companies jumped on board and everything else but sony absolutely dominated this thing and it all started with this tps L2, weird model number for sort of, it, 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 see at the time there is no Walkman um, branding on this thing, it's just uh, it's just Sony and we've got uh, stop, eject and it's stereo of course, fantastic and um, it's got a microphone I didn't know that um, it actually uh, did recording fast forward, rewind and it's got dual headphones so that two people could listen at once fantastic and none of this full graphic equalizer rubbish, no siree, tone, high or low, thank you very much. And this hotline button supposedly let you talk between the two um, the people, well, <laughs> between yourself and the other person listening here, but then, like, you've got the mic here and you're, like, right next to them. Like, you hold it up and you can, like, whiz talk into it and you, the person who's tethered to you by the um, headphone socket a meter away is going to hear you. What the... I don't know, for use on motorbikes or something else? I got... Eh, serial number 61,954. That's pretty low. Um, I wonder if it is the original... Uh, 1979. It wasn't released in the US until 1980, though, but once it did... Ooh, boy, it changed people's lives, the Sony Walkman. And then in 1987, Sony went, well, bugger this analog rubbish, we want to go to digital. So they released the DAT, the Digital Audio Tape Walkman. DAT is a uh, format, physically uses a smaller uh, cassette than the, there we go, smaller cassette tape than your, than your regular um, audio analog cassette and of course it recorded digitally it was like helically uh, scanned head and all that sort of jazz and if we open her up there we go look at that Whoa, fantastic that's it all oh, looking see the head down in there <gasps> Whoa, wow fantastic can't wait to do a tear down of this puppy and uh, there we go digital audio tape could sample uh, terribly advanced for the day. It could uh, sample 16-bit, uh, 48 kilohertz. Um, so, you know, as good as or better than uh, CD, basically. And this was, well, pretty revolutionary. And the music industry was so uptight that people could actually copy things digitally and, and record and rip things in super high quality that they tried to have this uh, sucker band, I believe, in the uh, late... 80s, but uh, I don't think I'm not sure if that was uh, successful or not. Anyway, uh, yeah, record. It's got you know some fairly sort of you know high end features. We've got uh, record level. You can got uh, auto music or speech uh, record level modes, or you can set it manually, and it could take line in or an external mic with uh, selectable sensitivity so these were great for field recording and things like that and there were professional versions of these uh dat uh, recorders but uh, you know even this one would be uh fairly useful to uh people that you know reporters and things out in the field it would still work a treat this is actually the tcd 07 model and battery compartment i really like the uh flippy retain metal uh, is that a is that a metal bar? No, it's not a metal bar, but it's a uh, plastic retain. That actually works really well. And the, what? I do actually like the battery, battery carrier. Look at that. Beautiful. It just slides right into those contacts down there. Very nice. Oh, check out this Maxil tape, would you? Look at this. Digital uh, capacity. Massive two gigabytes for a 90 minute tape. Two gig unbelievable but hey back then that was absolutely absolutely phenomenal Ta -da! 
And it's loading, loading, loading. And the LCD is not great. You tilt it like that, almost horizontal, and it's just, yeah, it's pretty darn ordinary. I don't think there's anything. There wasn't anything on the... Well, the other tape didn't seem to work. It didn't seem to do anything, so I'm not sure. Like, it's not... It's not playing. Maybe it doesn't detect the data. I don't know. I've never used a DAT. Very interesting shape there, how it just uh, protrudes out and is rounded like that. I'm not sure if that was like a physical design uh, thing. They tried to make it uh, all square and then they went, oh no, we've got to squeeze in the headphones connector here and well, let's just make it sort of a funky shape and make it look like, oh, it's, you know, designed to fit in your hand or something like that. And actually, it's a really quite a good looking unit. It's really quite heavy though. Once you put the batteries in there and it's like all metal case, it's, yeah, hmm. And I had completely forgotten about the Sony Video Walkman. Look at this, plays Video 8. Ah, uh, cassette tapes, fantastic, on oh, a beautiful tilt screen, look at this, UHF and VHF, ha <laughs> ha, you can watch the video from UHF on this puppy, well, only if they were broadcasting it, analog TV's dead, but oh wow, this thing is built like a brick dunny, it really is, look, you can plug a, a camera into the thing for, uh, you know, a field, field recording, on this thing, fantastic, so you could uh, use composite um, input and uh, you could get composite output to drive an external monitor as well, but to hook a, a camera up to it, I wonder if anyone used this for any uh, professional field recording or anything like that, but uh, uh, modulation in, what does that do? Anyway, UHF, VHF, fantastic, and look at the ventilation grills on this thing, I mean, it just goes all the way around like that. This puppy must have got really hot. Look at that metal grill on the back. You can see the, uh, see some, I think, sh oh, no, not shielded cans. It's just a plastic matrix in there. But yeah, there's probably like a big shield, big ass shielded can for the whole thing or something. But yeah, uh, don't have the battery. Unfortunately, that would have plugged in here. It gave about 45 minutes to an hour's use. Looks serial number. That's reasonably low, 18,426. I wonder how many of these things they actually sold. But, geez, yeah, 1989 vintage. Look at that. The Sony Video Walkman. Can we power on? Oh, it helps if I turn my bloody power supply on, doesn't it? Okay, here we go. Nope. No, not a sausage. Oh, haven't got one of those stupid coated batteries, have they? I tell you what, I found a use for my parrot clips already. I don't think I was getting good contact on these uh, terminals with my little crappy alligator clips. So um, I've used my parrot clips here. Unfortunately, there's not a huge reach on there. I might just uh, spin it around, but let's try it again. Oh yeah, I'm draw I, my power supply is showing, sh showing 6 milliamps now, in, when it's uh, turned off, so, hello, hello, <laughs> look, we've got crap static, battery down, oh that's, yeah, that's dropping the uh, test leads, yeah, oops. And yeah, I was trying to use these little wimpy thin things, no, I put in some beefier cable in there and no problems whatsoever, not getting as much uh, drop along the cable, it wasn't the parrot clip, it was the, uh, was the copper in there. And this puppy just on idle draws about 5 watts. Oh, oh, we're in like Flynn, look at this, I'm just going, there is a tape in here, I have no idea what's on it, hope it's not someone's porno. Play. Let's see what we got. What is it? I can't... It's... Oh, no, there's something wrong with the screen. That... that All that stuff is on the screen. Ah, oh, bummer. What do we got? We've got some dude with a rockin' moustache. And... No, nah, he was operating something. Got no idea. Yeah, that screen is in uh, bad shape. I'm not sure what the hell's... It almost looks like it's some sort of physical thing behind the screen maybe oh god we got some sort of corporate presentation ah <sighs> yeah well, it's not something behind the screen because we can turn the screen off and on here we can uh, data screen on off there we go no there's uh 
No, there's, there's something wrong with the, like the video decoder or, you know, something like that. I mean, all the digital um, overlay stuff looks just fine. We've got an SPLP switch on the side. Long play mode. Really, uh, yeah, 1980s problems here with the uh, SP and LP mode. So there's some dude talking about something, but I uh, can't hear anything. I assume it had a built-in speaker. Surely, I got the volume up. Hmm. Oh, we've got a nice sunset now. Fantastic. And I can adjust the colour as well. There's a tweaker on top to saturate the colour there. Ha <laughs> ha, beautiful. Oh, black and white. Yeah, colour. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Roland and Max. This was fantastic. Exactly what I wanted. The Sony Walk, original Sony Walkman, and two other absolute classics. These are going to make some great teardown videos coming up. I think I'll shoot one tomorrow. Next up, we got one from Vietnam. Hi to all my Vietnamese viewers. This one is actually a third suck of the sav. It comes from uh, TechBox, who. If you've been watching the blog for a while, you know they've sent in a couple of things before, namely the uh, Listen device, the, um, uh, you know, EMI um, uh, common mode uh, sniffer box, and, and sorry, and the, um, and the EMC sniffer probes as well. They've sent in something new. Hi, Dave. Another open hardware um, thing from Hein. Thank you very much, Hein. And, oh, is it going to come out? Come on, come on, it's got a nice big heatsink on the top. Anyway, TechBox makes some nice stuff, and this is another open source hardware thing. Oh, I think you actually saw it. Did I give it away on the front? Doll. I think I did. Oops, sorry for the, oh, I don't want to pull it. If I pull it out by the heatsink, it feels a bit, I don't want to break the mounts on the heatsink. Oh, there we go, it's a real tight fit. Ta-da! Look at that! It is a self-powered active load, 2 volts to 70 volts. Beautiful! Let's take a closer look at it. And here it is, it's a self-powered active load, i.e. a dummy load. And it's got both constant current and constant resistance mode as well. And I'll tell you why it's uh, important in a minute, but here we go. We've got um, where well, you plug your load into here. It's got a uh, current meter by the looks of it. You can uh, actually measure your uh, current going through if you want to and it's got external voltage control as well so if you want to like do a uh, pulse load for example um, this will just do constant current or constant resistance but if you wanted to like feed in a pulse into here you could go boop and then load and then boom so you could actually or step different loads or ramp up a load or whatever you want um, with the voltage control here very nice yes it is open source hardware and it's got a uh, nice little um 10 turn pot here to precisely set that. We'll measure that in a second, see how precise it just is. But the interesting thing about this one, as opposed to all other, well, most other uh, dummy loads out there, is it's self powered. And that's why it only works down to two volts. It's got to have from at least two volts in there to power the circuitry inside. Now, the reason this self powered is important is because this model is completely analog. There is no digital stuff in there at all even to do the constant resistance mode there is no digital switching circuitry in, in here at all there's no process and no nothing the reason this is important is because when you're using a dummy load on a power supply for example to test the output of a power supply and you're getting noise measurements on the output of your power supply really low level measurement stuff you don't want your measurement devices, i.e. your load here, you don't want your load actually contributing, either radiating out from through the wires, radiated emissions, any noise. And you certainly don't want it emitting um, any RF um, stuff as well, or even, you know, you don't want it, you don't want anything. So there being a purely analog, non-digital, non-processor, no clock in there or whatever, active load, fantastic for low noise power supply measurements. Here's our little manual that comes with it. It says it's not their original design. It's based on uh, Joel uh, Setton's design. He's from France. Hey, Joel, if you're watching, uh, it was published in a 2005 EDN article. Precision active load operates uh, as low as 2 volts. So it's based on that circuit. But um, Hein and the uh, people at TechBox have uh, 
just turn this into a nice little project. And there's the schematic. I'm having a hard time reading the stuff on here. It's a very incredibly small uh, print. It's A4 shrunk down to like a one fifth of the size or something. Anyway, um, there's an instrumentation amp here. Here's our uh, constant uh, uh, resistance mode selectable over here or uh, constant current mode over here. We've got various uh, output transistors. They're a, uh, uh, they're a darling. No, they're not exactly a Dar well they're a, like a Darlington uh, type configuration and um, various uh, re sense resistors down the bottom here but yeah there's not much to it it's all analog and specs as I said uh, 2 volts minimum input which is okay you know if you're testing a 1.2 volt power supply yeah, you're out of luck unfortunately only works down to 2 volts but uh, yeah maximum dissipation uh, 25 watts with just the passively cooled heatsink on top although if you whack a fan on top which wouldn't be hard at all uh, you can get up to 100 watts uh, continuous four different ranges 0 to 1 amp with the 10 turn pot 0 to 10 amps 1 ohm to 10 ohms and 10 ohms to 100 ohms a very usable ranges there I like it and the reference drift eh, half a bees dick all right I've got it on a hundred milliamps uh, per turn here so it's per turn of this 10 turn pot it's down at zero and um, this is quite an accurate power supply the rogol dp832 like 0.05 percent so we don't need anything better so let me turn this up to single turn here and we should get bam on 100 milliamps and we do fantastic super duper accurate awesome so let's go uh let's get close to full scale here well let's go right up to an amp shall we here we go oh look, actually turn, turn it back tweak it back oh look at that it's bang on beautiful and stupid me tried to test the uh, constant resistance mode so I set it down to one volt so the math would be nice and easy and of course duh, it doesn't work at all because it's minimum voltage is two volts oh! Now the thing with constant resistance mode here, it's actually backwards. So like it might be 100 ohms per turn, but uh, I've got it on zero, which you'd expect, well, okay, it should be like zero ohms, but it's not. It's actually the lowest possible. So I turn it up, so I'm increasing the resistance, and the current is increasing. So there you go. It's just back to front. Just be aware of that. So it actually makes sense if you read it properly. It's 100 ohms, not per turn, but it's 100 ohms divided by the number of turns. So in this case, I've set it to exactly 5. So it's 100 ohms divided by 5. So that's 20 ohms, and I've got an output voltage of 10 volts. So 10 volts on 20 ohms give me, gives me my half an amp. And it's going to be slightly out there because you're going to get some increased uh, contact resistance. See, if I wiggle that around, it's going to change a bit. You're going to get some increased resistance, which is going to be a, you know, a small percentage of your value. And just be aware that during general use, you have to actually sh put a shorting plug on here. You can't just leave this Ampere thing um, open. I realized that when I first uh, plugged it in and it didn't work and I was scratching my head. And yeah, there should be like a shorting switch on there or something like that. Now, I don't mind the uh, case design there, but it's a little bit how you do it. And this is like one of these, uh, it's not even a genuine Pactec case. The tilting bales a bit wonky and the front panel check it out doesn't quite fit properly so yeah it's a bit how you're doing but it's still it looks okay don't mind the uh, concept of having the heatsink on top that's pretty good and here's a two minute tear down this is actually upside down because they've got the board mounted on the top because the uh, transistors are uh, you can probably just see them under there they're actually bolted to the bottom of the heatsink down there and well are they actually screwed it yes they are actually uh, screwed into there and then uh, <laughs> they've drilled the holes in the uh, plastic case on top so that's rather neat anyway there's our uh, 10 turn pot it's all nice and neat and tidy they've crimped those and put heat shrink over those and it's all fine and dandy it's just a shame that that front panel's a little bit loose but yeah that's nice so there you go, that's the TechBox self-powered active load. Really, 
quite nice. I rather like it. This will actually come in handy for the new, testing the new uh, micro supply. Shame it only goes down to two volts, but yeah, you can understand because it's self-powered active load. The op amps inside have to, you know, uh, the active the op amps have to, you know, work. So. Yeah, not gonna you're gonna have a hard time getting much uh, lower than that the only issue might be is I'm not sure about the uh, protection on the input if you get reverse polarity they warn you on the back you know don't hook it up reverse polarity they do have a uh, there we go a reverse biased uh, diode in the in in input in series with a uh, 10 amp um, fuse there so yeah assuming that the uh, diode can um, handle that and yeah you don't blow up anything else it's <laughs> not too bad at all if you plug it in backwards yeah just don't plug it in backwards because you can screw up the power supply under test too that would really ruin your day so yeah but it's not like that they can you know put like a series diode in here or something because then you're you know blowing out an extra half a volt 0.6 of a volt so yeah so i can understand the limitation there but Anyway, um, self-powered active mode, very nice, 139 US dollars, quite a reasonable price. So I think well worth having if you're in the market for an active load, especially if you're testing low noise, um, well, any power supply and you intend to uh, test power supply noise and things like that. You don't want your active load contributing to your noise because you can get uh, conducted emissions out of here as well as radiated emissions from other products so really very nice i think pretty good value at 139 bucks so links down below thank you very much hein and it's not a mailbag without one of these let's take a look this one comes from ron berry thank you very much ron he's from uh, monterey in uh oh is it yeah california yes it is i'm <laughs> wondering if there's more than one monterey in the u.s i've uh, been to monterey awesome when i drove up from um right down from San Diego all the way up to uh, San Fran uh, by way of uh, Silicon Valley and everything else. So let's have a look. It's going to be vintage. It's going to be vintage. Mm, late 70s. Whoa. Let's... <laughs> it's... That looks Russian. That looks Russian to me. Russian calculator. Awesome. <laughs> Late. That's got to be... It's a Mark 52 Russian calculator. Oh, two-minute teardown. Beauty. And here's the Electronica Mark 52. I'm sure that says Electronica. It's got an A on the end. Um, and this is a Soviet calculator, as in the Soviet Union, before they... Yeah, the Soviet Union dissolved. Awesome. And um, Ron says that uh, it's supposed to work, but I've put some... Oh, oh, actually, kind of. Can you see it? Can you see it? Oh, barely. It's supposed to work. Something... Oh, there's a zero. There's a zero. I can just see it. Yes, it, it does kind of work. There we go. Wow, look at that. It's, maybe it takes time to warm up. Oh, geez, that vacuum fluorescent display has really seen better days. Looks like it's a uh, two, four, is that? Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven digits, is it? With uh, two, four, six, eight working digits, so it'll have uh, exponent as well. So probably a two-digit uh, exponent on there, and uh, plus the negative sign. But, yeah, it's, it does work. And yeah, there we go. There's the negative exponent down in there. Wow, that's really super duper dim. This has quite possibly the worst calculator keypad I've ever used. These keys are just so wonky. Look at that. Oh man, dodgy brothers. Look, I can just force them to go in one direction. <laughs> that is terrible. That's terrible, Muriel. Look at that. Unbelievable! Wow, and the feel is... And of course, being the fluent Russian speaker that I am, I know that that's the exponent key. Now, Ron says this was manufactured in the Soviet Union during the 80s and the early 90s. I was still going into the early 90s. Oh my goodness, with this sort of quality. But it's, I guess, typical, uh, typical Russian. Have we got a uh, serial number on there for those... Playing along at home, there we go. 
And for you fanboys out there, yes, it's RPN. Reverse Polish notation. Fantastic. And uh, Ron says, as far as he's aware, it's the only calculator that has an internal E squared prom memory, external ROM modules, connector under the upper right panel. Oh, is that it? And which allowed uh, them to play, change apps and play games and stuff. Yes, it is programmable. It's not just a scientific calculator. It's certainly not a four-banger, that's for sure. And Ron says that these, these were used as a backup for onboard uh, computers on the Soyuz spacecraft. Mm, I don't know. I wouldn't rely on that keyboard. I mean, it's all really flimsy. It's not exactly... Um, oh, God, I can see the screen going there. Mm, goodness, yeah. Well, you know, rough and ready. Hmm. And I think we've got some genuine... 1980s Soviet uh, warranty void if removed gunk. Wow, check out inside this puppy. Look at this resistor network, single in line package resistor network. Just bend them over, she'll be right, mate. No worries. And check out that wonderful uh, flip chip. Like, is that? No, that's like a donded, bonded uh, die, like chip on board kind of arrangement. Wow, it's got some gunk over it and uh, got some through-hole diodes. Yeah, it does look like, you know, 1980s vintage. We've got ourselves a custom uh, custom ASIC there. Oh, let's, let's trim the uh, frequency, shall we? I think that's what it's for. And uh, there's our um, uh, inverter for our vacuum fluorescent display. Oh, fantastic. But uh, there's another chip on board, device under there, and another one there as well. But yeah, wow. Look at that. Old school. Got some flat flex going down there to the uh, keyboard, no doubt. And there's the expansion ROM connectors uh, on there, the expansion packs under these dicky little uh, clips here. I already sort of broke one off. Only two of them uh, work. These two don't have anything. Uh, you can tell by the tell by the connectors there. This is an external uh, DC jack here. And there's a close-up shot of our uh, chip on board. It's not actually chip on board. It goes to like what looks like a flat. So it's chip on uh, flat flex. It looks like it is flip chip. So it could be like it wouldn't be BGA back in the 80s. Um, so I don't know what or, it, well, yeah, it doesn't look high enough to be die-bonded. Like, it doesn't look like gunked high enough to be die-bonded. Don't see any bond wires coming out of the thing. But, yeah, it's on a separate... I've seen this construction in another uh, calculator. It might have been a uh, Soviet one, actually. But, yeah, the, so they've put it onto this uh, flat flex on the back. I, you know, I can't get under there. But, yeah, it's like a printed flat flex. And then that is... Um, Surface mount, you know, acts as basically a surface mount chip to uh, uh, go onto the board there. It's not uh, reflow soldered. Somebody's done that with a good old-fashioned soldering iron. And for those who want to translate the keypad, there you go. Ron's uh, very thoughtfully done that for us. So thank you very much, Ron. That was certainly one very interesting 1980s bit of calculator kit. And just, like, awful construction... Quite like, the board inside is okay, you know, no problems whatsoever. It's actually quite advanced there with its um, surface mount uh, construction and stuff like that. But just the just the quality of the case, it's got like a couple of clips here. It's only got two screws on the back here. And they use this as the backup for the Soviet Soyuz um, capsule computer. It's like, oh, I wouldn't trust this thing to survive at all. It's just... It's just all flimsy and, um, yeah, no thanks. Next up, we've got one from La Poste, titled All My French Viewers. We don't get too many from France, do we? So, uh, let's, looks like it's got a pull tab thingy, and I have no idea what it says, because I think it's French um, in the description, so... Ta-da! Let's have a look at this La Poste. Oh. Oh. Thank you very much. I'm gonna like this. I'm gonna like this. I haven't got one. I have not got one. But I do now. Ta-da! 
Back to the Future. That's the um, Sun Star. One one eighty one eighteenth scale. I was just looking at uh, awesome. Thank you very much. I was just looking at the Matchbox one eighteenth one. I um, yeah, because there's I think there's three companies that are making one eighteenth Sun Star, somebody else, and there's a there's a Matchbox one as well. So I was probably going to get the Matchbox one so I can do an awesome comparison with the Sun Star one. Oh. oh. Oh, oh, well, it's just foam at the moment. It looks like he's added the foam for my own protection. Thank you very much, uh, Fred, uh, Frederick Dutry. Um, he's from Saint Lafard in France. I've got to be pronouncing that wrong. It's got to have some feminine or masculine form or something. Sorry, I don't speak French. I did like two lessons and then gave up because I used to work for a French company and they offered uh, free French lessons. And so I thought, oh, yeah, it'd be cool to learn uh, French, so I went along to the classes thinking, oh, we'll learn how to say hello, you know, just general stuff first, and no, let's jump straight into the masculine form and the feminine form and learning all the base structure. God, I'm sure that's important, but it's kind of like learning electronics by being taught, you know, fundamental uh, physics first. Well, here's the electron, here's the atom, the electron, and blah, 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 and before, it takes two years before you get to bloody, you know, flash in a lead. Unbelievable. So yeah, I didn't last too long. Wasn't too impressed by that. <gasps> oh, awesome. 1 18th. Uh, this is the original, um, the, the original movie one. It's got the hover uh, conversion. I think there's a lever on the bottom to move the wheels up. I was literally just what, uh, looking at the, these last night, the, well, the Matchbox one in particular, um, but I sort of wanted to like get the complete uh, set and yeah, this is the uh, Sunstar one. Fantastic! It's got Mr. Fusion on the back and the um, and the hover conversion wheels. The Matchbox one does not have the hover uh, conversion wheels. But um, yeah, I was watching some YouTube review uh, last night and I think he uh, compared the Sunstar one had better um, uh, stain brush stainless, more accurate brush stainless steel finish than the Matchbox one, and it, this one also rode lower to the ground than the Matchbox one, it rode higher, and um, but that is, oh, too generous. Thank you very much, Fred, that's awesome. Oh, it's gonna have to like sit on the desk along with my Lego Back to the Future, brilliant. And there is apparently a, uh, what is it, a one, f not one fourth, like one sixth scale or something, like some huge thing coming out. I don't think it's actually released yet. Forget the actual scale, but yeah, I think this is about the biggest. I think there's a 1 15th somebody might do, but this is a, a 1 18th scale, isn't it? But, ah, oh, yeah. Terrific. Oh, love it. Oh, and there's the money shot. Look at that. Yes. The gold wing doors don't stay up. Kind of. Oh, beautiful. Oh, wow, look at that. It's a thing of beauty. Fantastic. Oh, a bit of a wonky how you do an out of time number plate there. Wow. And Mr. Fusion doesn't tilt or come off, but uh, yeah, it's not. I think the uh, Matchbox one is uh, superior in all its uh, detail up the back here. I'm going to get one and. Uh, have a look. So yeah, I don't think it's as screen accurate as the Matchbox one, but still very, very nice model. Time circuit's on. There you go. You can see the time display. You can see the big lever and the big uh, rotating switch there for the to switch the time circuits on. And where's the flux capacitor? It's in there somewhere. Can just see the flux capacitor in. Ah, oh, the bloody flippy door doesn't stay up. Oh, unbelievable. Can't say I'm a big fan of the uh, seat belt here, which is sort of just all molded into the seat there. I'd rather just not have any seat belt at all. That's a bit lame. And yes, it converts to hover mode. Ta da! Whoosh. I've got to admit, I do like the uh, stainless steel, the brushed stainless steel look of the paneling on this thing. It works, uh, works really well for me. 
And yes, the bond opens, but no, there's no engine in there because it's in the back. So thank you very much, Fred. That is way too awesome. And if you want to see a comparison of this and the Matchbox model, um, I will no doubt have that on my EV Blog 2 channel, which is linked in down below. That's where I put all my sort of miscellaneous videos that don't really belong on the main channel. They're not sort of important enough to put there. I've already got like 10,000 subscribers or something on my uh, secondary channel, so hop on over there. So that's it for mailbag for another week or two. No, I'll probably I'll try and do one next week. I've so much stuff to clear out. Thank you, everyone, for sending in stuff. It keeps the mailbag segment alive. Very awesome, very generous of everyone, because I know it does actually cost a lot of money to send um, big and heavy stuff, um, even light stuff overseas. So everyone really appreciates it, certainly me. So if you like mailbag Monday, ooh, thumb off screen. Poor framing error there, amateur video blogger I am. Um, yeah, give it a big thumbs up. I think it's that way on YouTube. Catch you next time.